This is the story, the fantastically true story, of Herbert A. Philbrick, who for nine frightening years did lead three lives. Average citizen, high-level member of the Communist Party, and counter-spy for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. For obvious reasons, the names, dates, and places have been changed, but the story is based on fact. You're about to see the Communist Party's complete disregard for human rights as they affect their plan of sabotage. Oh, have him come in. Well, <laughs> hello, Herb. Very, it's good to see you again. This is Bennett. May I present Mr. Philbrick? Herb, Mrs. Doreen Bennett. How, How do you do, do? Mr. Philbrick? Nice to know you. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Hey, let me get you a chair, Larry. Well, uh, Herb and I studied geology at the same school. Yes, but not with the same result. While Larry went on to become a geology professor, I never got beyond igneous rock. Well, Herb. We're in trouble. And you're the man to help us, if you will. I do, if I can. What's the problem? Have you read the morning paper, Mr. Philbrick? Uh, part of it. Did you notice that there were three more cases of vandalism over the weekend? Yes. Yes, I did. Nothing stolen, nothing taken from the school. Just wanton destruction. And it seemed to be getting worse instead of better. So with the blessing of the city council, the mayor has appointed Mrs. Bennett to form a committee to investigate and to try to do something about it. I see. Dr. Hiller tells me you've had considerable experience with youth groups. Mm, quite a bit. We need a publicity man, Herb. There's no money in it, so we need someone who work for free. Well, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do with you. I'll uh, take the job at the salary offered. When do I start? You start right now. The first thing we need is an article for publication addressed to parents. Something that might waken the public to the need of unified action. Oh, bearing in mind, of course, that the purpose of the committee is to prevent vandalism rather than punish it. Yeah, I think I know what you have in mind. Good, Mr. Philbrick. Well, we won't keep you now, and it's been a pleasure meeting you. Uh, nice meeting you, Mrs. Bennett. So long, Herb. Someday I'll try to bring you a little business with a fee attached to it. Good, good. And uh, soon let's sit down and talk over those good old days, shall we? At our first committee meeting. Right. So long. There are only 24 hours in a day, Philbrick. The Communist Party, the FBI, and your work here in the office take every minute of your time now. When will you write publicity for Mrs. Bennett's committee? Yes? This is the lost and found department of the bus company. We're trying to locate a Mr. H.P. of 290 West Broadway. Could that be you? You must have the wrong person. This isn't 290 West Broadway. Well, we have to be very careful in a case like this. You understand, don't you? Yes, I understand. Yes, you understand, Philbrick. You understand you're to make contact with a member of the Communist Party at 290 West Broadway, and without letting any grass grow under your feet, get going. Your contact is Comrade Logan, Philbrick. This must be high-level business. He's a big man in the party. You just had a visit from Mrs. Doreen Bennett and Dr. Lawrence Hiller, right? Right. We've been watching Mrs. Bennett. We're told she's organizing a committee to investigate vandalism. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Why did they come to see you? Well, Lawrence Hiller is an old friend of mine. They want me to handle publicity for the committee. Handling publicity for Mrs. Bennett's committee is a fine job for an undercover communist. Yeah, I see what you mean, comrade. The party will help you prepare the publicity. We'll knock this investigation into a cocked hat. Well, there's just one thing. It may not be possible to... For the party is concerned, nothing is impossible. Stand by for contact within the next few days. See that we get a copy of everything you prepare for the committee. 
Just as you say, comrade. In the meantime, we'll furnish you with some ideas to include in your writings. That's all. What if they want me to feed them something fast? How do I get in touch with you? You can't. Find some way to stall until we reach you and approve the copy. This puts you right in the middle, Philbrick, in a spot where you could use the advice of Special Agent Daniels, FBI. Hello. Hello, this is Philbrick. Are those uh, commercial recordings ready for me to hear? They will be in about 10 minutes. Would you like to stop over and hear them? Yeah, I would. Okay, see you in 10 minutes. This is Daniels. Clear the recording studio for a contact with Philbrick. Obviously, there's just one answer to this situation. Are we both thinking of the same thing? The commies want to see vandalism flourish. They'll exploit it to the skies. And they'll make it the coat hanger for larger and more violent crimes. Thanks. Fits right into the party line, doesn't it? Well, they probably figure a kid who can be encouraged to hack up a schoolroom today would be ordered to set fire to the White House tomorrow. And what do we do about it? First, we have to get physical evidence the comrades are mixed up in this. Otherwise, it's a matter for the local police. And then what? Well, if we have the evidence, we can go to work. Meanwhile, what do I do about this publicity setup? How am I going to satisfy both the commies and Mrs. Bennett? Well, at the moment, I don't know. Golly, unless we think of something. Herb, I have an idea. Yeah? Where can we find Comrade Logan? <laughs> I don't know. Apparently, he intends to keep himself well hidden. But you do expect him to contact you in the next day or so. That's right. When he does, try to... No. We'll be ready. Maybe we can help you out of the frying pan without dropping you into the fire. Hey, Roger! Hi, Mickey! What's new? Hey, I've been thinking over what you said. What do you get out of all this? Fun. And a little excitement. And did you ever stop to think how many laws you have to obey from the time you get up till you go to bed? Well, I don't know, maybe five, ten. More like a hundred. And who makes those laws? Well, I guess they're made by everyone. Those laws are made by capitalists, by big business. Well, so what? They make a law that says you can only earn $10 a day. Then they make another law that takes $8 away from you. Now, what do you got left? Can anybody live on $2 a day? No, I guess not. But why not go out and make $100 a day? Oh, Mickey, you, you missed the point. The capitalists are running your life. Don't you see that? Yeah, I guess so. I, I don't know. Tell you what. I know a man. Used to be a big shot in business. And when he found out what was going on, how every drop of blood was being squeezed out of the working man, he quit a $100,000 a year job just to help people like you and me. Would you like to meet him? Hey, okay. Hey, but what's... What's big business got to do with us smashing up a hey, school? Hey, Mickey. Look, if you're going to get set in this, you, you kind of got to watch what you're saying, especially in public. Now, look, you meet me tonight after dinner, and we'll go over and have a talk with this man. His name's Logan. He's one swell guy, and, and he'll give you the real lowdown on things. Roger. Roger. I don't imagine there's any red-blooded youngster who hasn't at one time or another felt a mad desire to burn down the schoolhouse. <laughs> <laughs> or drop your math teacher in a pot of boiling oil. <laughs> Come on, uh, Mickey, sit over there with Roger. But really, we had nothing against a math teacher and we had no desire to burn down the schoolhouse. But the average man's right to live, to work, and to raise his family in peace is slowly but surely being stamped out. And uh, Mr. Logan... Yes, Roger? Tell Mickey what you told us last week. Sure. You see, Mickey, there's a great work to be done, and we're just little people. We can't fight fire with fire. Our flame isn't bright enough. We can't even fight in the open as yet because we're not strong enough. But we can fight. Our cause is just. Our motive is for the protection and freedom of mankind. We're not destroying property for the fun of it. We're protesting. 
protesting against strangulation. We're letting the powers of this world know that young America is on the march. They may not listen to the few of us gathered here tonight, but multiply this meeting by a million, and it won't be long before they'll be forced to give this country back to the people, to you, to your parents, where it belongs. Think we're on the right track, Mickey? Yeah, I guess so. Who'd ever think you could smear up a schoolroom and be doing something for your country at the same time? Let's go, I'm ready. Whenever a person sits down to solve the problem of mathematics, he has to start with the fundamentals. Two and two are four, and so on. So when a person sits down to solve the problem of juvenile vandalism, he also begins with the fundamentals, namely the home. Sounds good. Carry on. Most parents know that Junior, especially before he could talk, was the most ruthless tyrant that ever breathed. He reached for everything he saw and screamed lustily if he didn't get it. He's a natural little vandal in the making. Uh, you can see I've got kids of my own. <laughs> but with education and with his parents' loving guidance and care, our little vandal becomes a useful citizen, a credit to his community, the backbone of his country. Mother and Dad, you know that the same procedure will operate the same way for the fellow that's a little older. Think it over. Think I'm on the right track? Oh, I think it's a splendid beginning. If you let me have it, I'll start making coffee. Well, I'd like to do a little editing on it. Do you suppose I could hold on to it until tomorrow? Well, I suppose so, but... Excuse me. Yes? Had your lunch yet? No, I haven't. Why don't you meet me at 290? Then we'll decide where we want to go. Suits me? When? Right. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Gee, I'm sorry. Some awfully important business has come up. We understand. We'll run along. Uh, will you have that article ready by tomorrow, Herb? I'll sure try. Uh, then I'll stop by and pick it up. Yeah, yeah, fine. So long, Larry. So long. Goodbye, Mrs. Bennett. Terminal 8721. Is this the right number? No, it isn't. Philbrick's on his way to make a contact with Logan. Advise the stakeout. Comrade Logan may lead a lonely life, but from now on, he'll have no secrets from anyone. Got me worried. Well, there were people in my office, uh, Larry Hiller and Mrs. Bennett. I had to get rid of them. This envelope contains some ideas we want to incorporate in your publicity. I'll do my best. Your orders are to include those ideas in your publicity and get them published. Understand? Yes, I understand, but I'm afraid you don't. That isn't the way it works. Let's not stand on the street and haggle, comrade. Those are the orders that were given to me, and I'm passing them on to you. You'll find a way to use the party's ideas. I might put it a little stronger than that. I might say you'd better find a way to use the party's ideas. That's all, comrade. The comrades mean business, there's no doubt of that. You're in a jam again, Philbrick. This time you're really in a jam. <laughs> you like an old bill collector. And with about the same results, I'm afraid. Honest, a thousand things have happened between the time I saw you yesterday and this minute. I, I haven't had a chance even to think about that article. Mm. Well, you know, her. this is liable to result in a reduction of your salary. I'll get at it this afternoon, I, I, I promise you. Well, we'll appreciate it. Mrs. Bennett has been offered space in every newspaper in town. Good. And starting tomorrow, we're having a daily 15-minute broadcast. Now, it would be wonderful if the newspaper articles and the broadcast could break at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it'd be great. Look, Larry, call me back later this afternoon. I'll have something for you, I promise. Bye. So long. So long. What's 
holding up the publicity on the vandalism, comrade. I got a good answer for that one. You are. I am. Now, look. The party got a real big break when Mrs. Bennett selected an undercover communist to work on that committee. Now, what are you trying to do? Get me fired before I can do anything to help us? What do you mean? Well, look at this copy. The title alone is enough to queer it. Don't blame the kids. Blame the system. Why, this stuff reeks of party-line propaganda. I'd never get away with it. My usefulness to the party will come to an abrupt and sad end. You have a better idea? You bet I do. Let me get started gradually. Let me, let me win their confidence. Then, then, bit by bit, I can start dropping in little things. Things that'll get by the publishers. No good, comrade. It's too slow. We want something in the paper the kids can read. Something that will make them want to redouble their efforts. But don't you understand? once more, we want it in the paper tomorrow. The end will justify the means and the consequences. That's all, comrade. One thing I can't understand, why does everything have to happen tomorrow? Apparently the party's heard about Mrs. Bennett's broadcast. They want to do something to spoil it. Uh, they've gone so far over on this thing. Steve, do you realize what would happen if I did manage to get this stuff printed in the paper under the committee's auspices? Why, it'd create such a riot that the committee'd be put right out of business. Kind of phrase, Herb, you've hit the nail exactly on the head. Mm. And if I don't get it in the papers, the party will put me out of business. Just sit tight. There's one thing that can happen to save the whole situation. But it's got to happen between now and tomorrow. All right now, men. We got something special on for tonight at the Melton Avenue School. They just got in a new shipment of textbooks. They're in a packing case in the basement. Now what we're going to do is take the books up to a classroom, tear them up, and paste them all over the wall. So what happens if we get caught? In the first place, we're not going to get caught. And if we ever do, Mr. Logan will see to it that we all get out. He will? Yeah, he sure will, because Mr. Logan's on our side, fellas, and he's one swell guy. All right, now you know where we meet and what time, so let's get going, huh? You first. Okay. <laughs> hey, what's so funny? You know, if anybody asks me what I'm studying in school, I'll tell them I'm taking a course in paper hanging. Go on, get out of here. Good night, Mickey. Nice work, Roger. Those kids will follow you to the end of the world. Kind of got my doubts about Mickey. Always trying to be funny. He'll be all right. There's a little smart aleck in all kids. Did you hear him ask me what happens if we get caught? Yes, I did. Mr. Logan, what does happen if we get caught? You'll be protected and taken care of. You haven't a thing to worry about. Not a thing. Light over here, fellas. Let's get to work. Would you youngsters be interested in knowing how you happen to be caught tonight? Well, I'm going to tell you anyhow. You're all in custody tonight because you've been working for the Communist Party. That's a lie. This is the FBI, son. You don't hear lies here. I know. I'm sorry, sir. But we weren't working for the Communists. 
honest. But you were, because your Mr. Logan is one of the most prominent communists around here. Mr. Logan, a communist? That's right. Of course, he never said anything about communism to you. Vandalism is like an epidemic. To hear or read about it creates a wave of mass hysteria among youngsters. Wakens a desire to go out and smash things. What's the result? Sooner or later, they're caught, and then it's a session in reform school. When they come out, they're bitter and disillusioned because Mr. Logan and his friends didn't stand by them. And they won't stand by you, believe me. So when they're released from reform school, they're easy prey for the communists, who will then assure them that nothing like this could happen if the comrades were in command. In the meantime, millions of dollars worth of damage is done. And a lot of worthwhile kids get a terrific start in the wrong direction. Well, that's the end of my speech. What you kids do from here on out is up to you. You can go on busting up schools, or you can fight on the right side. Think it over. Hi, Steve. Hi, Herb. Well, I took my stand this morning, did what I thought was right. You mean you turned in the article you wrote without any revisions by the Communist Party? That's exactly what I did. You know, Herb, that's just what I thought you'd do. And the question now is, what happens next? Next, we will hear a broadcast on what to do about juvenile vandalism. What? And it is my pleasure at this time to introduce Mrs. Doreen Bennett, Chairman of the Committee to Investigate Vandalism. Mrs. Bennett. Thank you, Dr. Hiller. And how do you do, ladies and gentlemen? The most authentic information we can get on any subject is always from someone who has had actual experience. And now we want you to meet four courageous young Americans who have a story to tell. Mickey, will you step to the microphone, please? Will you tell the audience your full name? Mickey Cannon. How old are you, Mickey? Seventeen. And you have a story to tell us about vandalism? I sure have. We'd like very much to hear it. I don't get it. What happened? We trailed Logan to his home day before yesterday. And when the kids gathered there last night, we knew we were on the right track. We waited around, and sure enough, the boys went out to do a job in a school. We caught them in the act. I had a little talk with them, and they agreed to go on the air and tell the truth. Well, how do you like that? I like it very much, but Mr. Logan won't. He's been undercover up until now, but that's all over. Then my article party will probably give you a pat on the back for not having exposed yourself along with Logan. Let's see what goes on with the broadcast. So now we're all going to get jobs and make some money. Our parents have paid for the damage we did, and we're going to see that they get every cent of it back. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you so much. Dr. Hiller, will you introduce our next guest? Thank you, Mrs. Bennett. Ladies and gentlemen, before the next interview, I would like to make a brief statement. Unfortunately, there are some youngsters who commit acts of vandalism for no apparent reason. Now, the youngsters in this studio do not fall in that category. They had a purpose in what they did, but they've had the courage to come forth and admit they were misguided. Daniels, yes. I see. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Comrade Logan must have heard the broadcast. He's leaving town fast. You gonna stop him? No. Wherever he goes, he'll make new connections. We may pick up a lot of information just following him around. Well. As long as everything seems to be under control, I'll be on my way. Oh, hey, I almost forgot. Here's a copy of what the well-dressed communist has to say about juvenile vandalism. Thanks, Herb. I'm collecting this type of literature. Had an idea you were. So long, Steve. Is there anything else you'd like to say about this situation, Roger? I know what the kids at school will think. Some of them will make it awfully hard on us. And maybe they should. We've been pretty foolish, and especially me. I was the one who talked Mickey and the other kids into this. And I'm ashamed and sorry. Maybe if the other kids realize what a chump I've been, it will be a good lesson. Anyway, I sure hope so. That's all. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. case killed the party's plan to fan the embers of vandalism into a nationwide blaze of violence. Next week,
we'll bring you another story from the files of Herbert A. Philbrick. The kind of story that could only be told by a man who for nine fantastic years served as a counter-spy for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. <laughs>